Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much indeed, Jim, for your introduction. Uh, thank you to you, Jennifer, uh, as well. It's a, a real pleasure to be here this evening at the University of Strathclyde. Uh, and I say that sincerely as a graduate of the University of, of Glasgow, but um, <laughs> I only ever say that to wind up the principal. Um, he knows I, I cherish uh, this university, uh, and I, I mean that sincerely, but it's a, a pleasure to be here, but it is a particular uh, privilege and honour this evening to be giving this lecture. Uh, I know that in doing so, I am following in some extremely distinguished footsteps, as Jim has just reminded us. Uh, including some people that I have had the privilege of working closely with uh, throughout my own professional career. Sir Harry Burns, uh, somebody I hugely admire, uh, who was Chief Medical Officer of Scotland uh, when I was Scottish Health Secretary. Uh, the late Professor Sir Neil McCormick, somebody I worked in with as a party colleague, uh, but uh, who was one of Scotland's leading constitutional lawyers and, of course, a former member of the European Parliament. Uh, and, of course, amongst many others, uh, the late Donald Dewar, our first First Minister, who delivered this lecture when he was the Secretary of State for Scotland. So it is with a great deal of humility uh, recognising the distinguished uh, people who have given this lecture before that I, I stand here before you this evening. It's also a pleasure and again a huge privilege to have the opportunity this evening to pay tribute to Lord Cobrandon. Lord Cobrandon produced a hugely important and influential report on constitutional change in 1974, which led indirectly to the first devolution referendum in 1979. He was also one of the outstanding Scottish judges of his generation. So even if Lord Colbrandon had never produced his report on children and young people, there's no doubt at all that he would be remembered fondly today as somebody who had a significant, enduring and beneficial impact on modern Scotland. And it is a great pleasure and privilege to pay tribute to him and I'm delighted that Heather Shaw, his granddaughter, is in the audience this evening. However, it is of course uh, the case that Lord Colbrandon's finest and most lasting achievement, the one that we are marking here this evening, uh, was his report that led to the establishment of the children's hearing system in 1971. A development that even today Scotland is admired and renowned for right across the globe. And when we read now the remit that Lord Cobrandon was given back in the early 1960s with its focus on, and I quote, the treatment of juvenile delinquents, we can see immediately that the tone and the language belongs to a different era because he was living in and doing this work and delivering this report in a different era to the one that we live in today. But I think that underlines the sheer brilliance of Lord Cobrandon and all of those who worked with them. Because not only did they develop a vision for doing things differently, not only did they also set out the important practical steps that were able to turn that vision into a reality, but perhaps most importantly of all, the vision they developed is one that endures almost half a century later. And it is a vision that still inspires all of us today. And that really uh, was no mean achievement and one that we should uh, pay tribute to tonight and for many, many years to come. Three years ago, when Lord Hope gave this lecture, he returned to an idea that he had used in one of his own court judgments. Uh, and he said that the special genius of the Cobrandon report lay in the distinction that it drew between establishing the facts of an offence and deciding on what is best for the child. What is best for the child? That distinction is one that remains central to children's hearings and it is uh, something that belief that we should be driven by what is best for the child that is enshrined in our law today. 
the welfare of the child is paramount, and that is a principle that we should abide by in any of our policy considerations and deliberations uh, as far as they affect children and young people. And that notion that the welfare of children is paramount, not just in the children's hearing system, but in society as a whole, is central to the belief, the vision that drives me and my government. The belief that our objective as government, as a society, should be to build a fairer and more prosperous country for this generation and those that come after us. In fact, if you were to ask me to sum up what I consider to be my most important mission as First Minister, what I consider to be the most important mission of any uh, politician in a position of leadership, it would be this, the mission of making real progress towards genuine equality of opportunity. Because if we fail in that mission here in Scotland or anywhere else, the fact is we don't only let down young people, but all of us are diminished. Our society as a whole is diminished if we fail in that mission. For every young person in our society who cannot fulfill their potential, all of us lose out on the talent, the ideas and the initiative of someone who could be contributing so much more to our society. Getting young people to see how much they can achieve, kindling that awareness into a spark or a fire of ambition, and then enabling them to realise that ambition. I think that is one of the key responsibilities for any government and indeed for our wider society. And giving young people the best possible start in life and supporting them through any challenges that they face in their childhood and adolescent years is essential if we are going to collectively rise to that challenge. Now, that of course involves a vast range of different policies and I can't focus on all of them this evening. Uh, but for example, it means doing everything we can to combat poverty. It means investing in housing and in the communities that our young people grow up in. It means promoting health and well-being, supporting and enabling young people to live full, uh, healthy, active lives. Uh, most important of all, perhaps, in that uh, obligation of giving every young person the best start in life and ensuring uh, the best life chances for all of our young people, of course, is education. Uh, as First Minister, I've made uh, very clear that I want to be judged, I want my government to be judged on whether we can succeed in closing the poverty-related attainment gap between children from our most affluent areas and those from our deprived areas. Our expansion of high-quality childcare now being overseen by uh, new Minister Marie Todd over the next three years will also help to ensure that we're giving every young person the best possible start in life, while also making it easier for parents, particularly mothers, to go back to work if that's what they want to do, to better provide for their own families. So education is absolutely central to my vision of the kind of country we want to be. But in my view, uh, that obligation to give every young person the best start in life also requires strong support for high quality universal services. Uh, universal services, of course, benefit all children. Sometimes that is the basis on which universal services are, are criticised, that they don't target support at those most in need. But I believe it's important to have a good provision of universal service, yes, to benefit all children, but also perhaps in particular to benefit children with greatest need, those from more deprived or disadvantaged backgrounds, not least because of the removal of the stigma uh, that often comes with means testing. That's why I believe uh, in that universal principle. Uh, one of our uh, most uh, recently introduced universal benefits is, of course, the new baby box. Uh, from August of this year, parents of all newborn babies receive the baby box. It's full of lots of practical things to help new parents, uh, but it's much more than a box full of practical benefits. Because the baby box, and this for me is the most important thing about it, it has symbolic value. 
It is provided to all babies, regardless of their background, regardless of the circumstances that they are born into. And in doing so, it's sending a signal that in Scotland, we value all children equally and that we're determined to do everything we can to support and encourage the potential of every child. And I think that is vital. And that message that all children are born equal and that we value all children as equals is the one that I believe should be the hallmark of this country of ours. So that's uh, what I believe in terms of giving every young person the best start in life. Of course, we must also make sure that in everything we do, we support uh, children and families uh, who most need our support. And indeed, that is my main focus uh, here tonight. And in that, it's particularly important, I think increasingly important, that we respect the rights of young people and that we listen to their voices, their views and their needs. You know, the guiding principle behind getting it right for every child is that children get the right support from the right people at the right time. And that's a principle that Lord Cobrandon would have recognised. You know, he sought to reduce what he called the arbitrary effects of what is still too often a haphazard detection process for identifying children who experienced what we now know as and increasingly understand as adverse childhood experiences, whether they involve abuse, neglect, violence or poverty. So we are, as a society, working to prevent those experiences, but also to help children uh, heal from trauma and to improve the well-being and resilience of children who encounter them. And it's worth noting, uh, because it has been controversial in recent times, that this emphasis on prevention and joint working lies firmly behind our proposals for named persons. Uh, that proposal is not about meddling in family life. It is about recognising that better information sharing between different professionals and different services is an important part of ensuring that children get the right support from the right people at the right time and that they are less likely to fall through the gaps in those services. So as we uh, take forward that approach, we need to ensure that the support we provide is consistent with and serves to enhance children's rights. Perhaps one of the things that has, has changed in the almost half century since Lord Cobrandon was doing his work, even although this uh, notion and concept ran very strongly through the work that he did, but one of the things that is even more important now is that need to understand and enshrine the rights of children uh, and their right to be heard and to be listened to. You know, when this lecture series was established in 1991, the first speaker was Professor Sanford Fox of Boston College Law School. Now, he had advised on the drafting of the 1989 Convention on the Rights of the Child. And he reflected then on the fact that in many ways, the Cobrandon Report was ahead of its time. Uh, he said that the idea that children should be active participants in decisions affecting them has only recently been enshrined in the new Convention, although these values have been the foundation stones of Scottish juvenile justice for 20 years now. So I think it's fitting that the country that led in so many ways the thinking that inspired the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child is itself now determined to go further. You know, Scotland has, through the UK, been a signatory to the Convention from the very beginning. But we now want to go further. Uh, we have taken the decision to look uh, afresh at how the Convention can be better embedded into Scottish legislation and policy. And one of the options uh, we will look at as part of that process is full incorporation of the UN Convention into the domestic law of our country. Now, that will require uh, consideration of some very complex issues, which we will take forward with expert input. But there are areas where we can start now. For example, uh, the Scottish Parliament will shortly legislate to raise the age of criminal responsibility from 8 to 12, a step that will put us in line with international standards. Uh, and the Scottish Government will support legislation to offer equal protection for children on physical 
punishment, uh, enabling Scotland to join some 50 or more other countries around the world which have already successfully made that change. In addition, we are starting a three-year programme to raise awareness of the rights of children and young people. Uh, we recognise that laws in themselves, although they are important, are not enough. They need to be accompanied by a change in culture, because it's that change in culture where we recognise that as part of what we do, children and young people must be listened to and heard. That change of culture is what will lead to a significant positive and sustained change in children's experiences. And one uh, crucial part of that is ensuring that children and young people not only get a chance to be heard, but as I have said, that they are listened to as well, that they feel that they have a full place in society and that they have some ability to shape their own futures. Uh, next year, of course, as many of you will know, is Scotland's year of children and young people. I, I had the privilege of launching the programme for the year a couple of weeks ago at the Oasis Youth Centre in Dumfries. It was an absolutely wonderful event, although there is, I have to tell you, some truly embarrassing footage of me doing what only can be described as the female equivalent of dad dancing uh, at this event. I have to say, I, I digress slightly, but it's the end thing I know for Scottish politicians to take part in celebrity TV shows at the moment. <laughs> I can categorically confirm that on the basis of that dancing performance, I will not be in Strictly Come Dancing anytime <laughs> soon. But the key thing about our year of young people next year is that it is being shaped by children and young people themselves. We're trying to give life to this notion that we must hear, listen to and reflect the voice of young people in everything we do. Young people themselves have decided that the year will concentrate on people between the age of 11 and 25. They've determined the programme of events. They've influenced the aims of the year. And as a result, and this is the important point, that will deliver a better outcome. It will be a, a year of celebration of young people's achievements and potential, uh, which is enjoyed by and has meaning for uh, young people. Uh, but there's a much bigger principle at stake here, and it runs through you know, everything I will say tonight, and that is about the need in our society today for children and young people to have a genuine say in the decisions that affect them. And that's possibly more important now than ever before. You know, we saw a couple of years ago in the referendum in 2014 when 16 year olds were allowed to vote for the first time that our young people are the conscientious, compassionate, thoughtful citizens that we always knew they would be. The decision to give them a vote and a voice was regarded as a success by virtually everyone. But we've also seen in recent years, perhaps most prominently in the EU referendum, that decisions taken by the population of the UK as a whole, uh, that young people might not, almost certainly would not have taken if they'd taken those decisions themselves. Now, that inevitably will happen in any democratic society, but it does increase the need for us to ensure that young people have a genuine say in shaping their own future. Uh, here, the, the Scottish Cabinet is trying to lead by example. Uh, back in February, we had a, a joint Cabinet meeting with representatives of the Children's Parliament and the Youth Parliament, and we discussed a range of issues uh, from mental health through to Scotland's relationship with Europe. Uh, and that event will now become an annual one, bringing, literally bringing young people uh, and their representatives into the cabinet room, the seat of government in Scotland, uh, to make clear our commitment to hearing and listening to the voice of young people. Uh, and that principle, uh, important generally, has to apply in particular to children who need particular care or consideration from the state. After all, it is a key test of any society uh, how we support and care for children who require special protective measures, as the Convention on the Rights of the Child would put it. We need to take extra steps to give them true equality of opportunity. And that includes giving them a voice when decisions are being taken that could change the course of their lives. And that's what we've tried to do in recent years in relation to children's hearings. As a result of our overall approach to children's services, and the move that we are seeking to make to prevention rather than dealing 
with problems once they have arisen. You know, the number of children referred to children's hearings has declined by almost three quarters over the course of the last decade. In 2006, it was 56,000. In 2015, it was 15,000. Uh, it might be worth noting that that mirrors the reductions we've seen of young people in the youth justice system generally. In 2006, the number of 18-year-olds in custody was 223. Last year, it was 81. Uh, with children's hearings, the commonest reason for a referral is now a concern about the child's welfare rather than a concern about offending behaviour. Uh, more than 80% uh, of children now who are in compulsory supervision uh, measures have only been referred because of their need for possible compulsory care or protection. You know, back in 1971, when the hearing system started, 80% uh, of cases were on the basis of possible offences. Now, I mention uh, that progress because it is progress, it is achievement, and I believe that kind of uh, progress flows from an approach that puts children at the centre of the developments that shape uh, their lives. Uh, and that approach, of course, uh, and that progress that has been made has allowed us to look at how the system works and make sure that changes are made to it that makes it continue to be fit uh, for purpose. Uh, back in 2010, uh, we initiated a, a consultation on reforms to the children. Uh, its hearing system and that of course demonstrated that it is still hugely uh, valued. The views that were heard in that consultation came from professionals, volunteers, academics, from young people themselves and that of course uh, the fact that all of these years on that review showed the value of the children's hearing system is a testament to the farsightedness and wisdom of the Cobrandon report but it is also a tribute to the expertise, dedication and the compassion of people involved in the children's hearing system. You know, observers from across the world, and I mentioned this earlier on, have spoken admiringly of the principles of the system set out by Cobrandon. But with any system, it's people who make it work, and it's people who determine whether it succeeds or fails. And there are so many people who contribute to the success in Scotland of our children's hearing system. That includes the area support team volunteers who help to monitor and support children's panel members. It obviously includes the panel members themselves who give up so much of their time for very little public recognition uh, and no financial reward. Uh, there are many children's panel members who end up considering the cases of more than a thousand children during the course of their contribution. And the positive difference they make to those children, to their families, to local communities is extraordinary. Uh, that applies, of course, also to the children's reporter staff and all of the other professionals who support children's hearings. And I uh, want to take the opportunity tonight uh, on behalf of the Scottish Government, on behalf of the whole country, to place on record my gratitude to each and every one of them. Uh, but of course, important though that work is, it's our duty to the next generation to make sure that those principles that Cobrandon laid down continue to be reflected in a system that is modern, updated and fit for purpose. So the reforms that were legislated for in 2011 have strengthened children's rights and clarified their roles and responsibilities. Uh, the role of national convener was established, supported by Children's Hearing Scotland, uh, with statutory duties associated with the recruitment, the selection, the training of panel members. Uh, the training and recruitment of safeguarders was also improved. Uh, these are the independent representatives who assess the best interests of children and provide advice, for example, when there's a dispute between different agencies. And of course, we've made it easier for children to gain access to legal representations. Now, these changes have delivered improvements and they will continue to deliver improvements. But we must never rest in our laurels. If everything I'm talking about tonight, about giving every young person the best chance in life, supporting those who most need us and hearing the voice of children and young people, if all of that is to be a reality, then we must continue to make sure that the systems we have reflect the needs of the society uh, we live in. The children's hearing system is wonderful and it is something all of us should be proud of, but we should never pretend it is perfect. Uh, we must continue to push for higher standards, 
precisely because the role it performs is so valuable. Uh, the Education and Skills Committee of the Scottish Parliament earlier this year highlighted some concerns from young people themselves, which are similar to some of the concerns I hear. For example, about how difficult it can be to understand the information they get uh, before hearings, including their own child's plan and the fact that uh, they're not always as aware as they could be of their own rights to participate in hearings. Uh, one measure which I think will help to address some of these problems was included in the Act that passed the Scottish Parliament in 2011. That provided for a, a nationwide advocacy service, one where an independent representative can speak up for a child's interests and concerns. Uh, a person who will be available for children who have expressed an interest in advocacy support uh, and for those who might otherwise not be able to participate fully in their own hearings. Uh, and you know, I'm delighted that we have uh, confirmed today that having run several pilots across the country, we're now allocating additional resources uh, to ensure that a truly nationwide service will be up and running uh, from September 2019. You know, independent advocates can help us to ensure that children's hearings become even better at hearing from children. By doing that, they can give an effective voice to some children whose views might otherwise not be properly heard. Now, a fundamental principle of the children's hearing system, of course, is that parents, uh, where possible, are the best people to bring up their own children. They should be encouraged and enabled to do so whenever possible. And when that isn't possible, children should be settled into a loving, permanent home as soon as is possible. And in those cases, depending on what is in the best interests of the child, options such as foster care, kinship care, residential care or adoption should be explored. Uh, Marie Todd, uh, tomorrow will attend an event to mark National Adoption Week. And I know that uh, she will stress tomorrow the point that I want to make this evening, how grateful uh, we all must be to adopting parents, foster parents and carers who choose to provide a loving home for children. Uh, many children with experience of care go on to do absolutely brilliant things through their own efforts and also because of the people who love and care for them. In fact, outcomes for the 15,000 looked after children in Scotland are improving. It's another sign of, of progress from the approach we are taking to prevention and listening to the voices of children. Uh, a few years ago, only four out of 10 looked after children uh, went on to be in employment training or further or higher education after leaving school. Now that figure is seven children out of 10. But even so, some of the statistics that still surround children who grow up in care are deeply concerning and they are unacceptable if everything I am talking about tonight about the value of children and young people and giving every young person the best start in life is to be a reality. You know, for example, only one in 16 care experienced young people will go on to university and it's estimated that a third of the prison population is made up of people who lived in care when they're growing up. In fact, some sources suggest that the proportion could be higher. While we've got statistics like that, none of us, certainly not me as First Minister, can be satisfied that we are living up to that ambition of giving every young person the best start in life. And that is precisely why we took the decision to launch the root and branch review of the care system. Fiona uh, Duncan, who as has been mentioned, is here tonight, is chairing that review. And uh, I know she will do uh, a fantastic job. The fundamental principle of it is that it will be driven by the involvement and views of children who have experience of care. Uh, their views and their stories, their experiences will be at the very heart of shaping what the best care in Scotland should look like. Um, I, on a personal level, I've uh, promised over the duration of the review to listen to at least a thousand children and young people who are either in care or who've had experience of the care system. So far I've spoken to and met with more than 150, so I've still got some uh, way to go, but I'm determined to meet that commitment. Uh, as Jim said, uh, the last time I was in this hall uh, was uh, when I attended the graduation of Callum Lynch, who is an ambassador of Who Cares. Uh, he was 
graduating in management and marketing from Strathclyde Business School just two weeks ago and I had uh, the pleasure uh, of being at his graduation ceremony as his corporate parent. Now, I have to say, I, I, I kind of half think that Callum invited me initially as a joke uh, and didn't actually expect me to agree to attend. Uh, but let me tell you, it was a privilege to be here. Callum, and there are many others like him, he is living proof of the fact that with the right support, young people who grow up in care can go on to achieve their dreams just like any other young person. And my fundamental, passionate belief that the state owes it to all young people to ensure that they all have that opportunity. In fact, I don't think the state has a more important or a more sacred duty than the one that we owe to children in care. And for all the superb work that has been done by people across the country, we know that we still need to do better. Uh, in particular, and this is what I've heard most loudly uh, and most passionately from the young people that I have spoken to, children and young people in care, uh, they need to be looked after in a practical sense, yes, but more than anything else, they want to feel that they are cared for and loved. Uh, and I've stressed the importance uh, of young people's rights right throughout this speech, but arguably, uh, or perhaps inarguably, the most important right of all uh, is the right for young people to be loved unconditionally as precious, unique, special human beings. Uh, I grew up in that kind of environment. I'm sure most of us in here uh, did. It is uh, almost literally the birthright of the vast majority of children in Scotland, and those who grew up in care uh, have a right to that just as much as any other young person. So that's why we've said in the work that Fiona will lead in the care review, that for all the practical uh, things that we'll look at, and for all of the practical recommendations, I have no doubt it will make, that will make life better for future generations of young people in the care system. That principle that will be at the heart of it is that simple principle of love. Every young person deserves to and has a right to be loved. At the start of my comments this evening, I, I quoted the opening words of Lord Cobrandon's remit. Uh, I want to end this evening with an excerpt from the end of his final report. Uh, he was speaking at the time of young people in the juvenile court system, and he said that it was necessary to extend to this minority of children the measures which their needs dictate and of which they have been too often deprived. Now that language, like the language I quoted earlier on, in the world we live in, sounds perhaps a bit dated. But the meaning behind those words is just as relevant today as it was in 1964. Uh, we must ensure that we give all children in our country the best possible start in life. But we must ensure that we provide the additional help, support, care and protection to the young people who need it most. That is an essential part of providing every child with the best possible start. And that needs strong support for universal public services. It requires a continuing focus on improving children's services specifically. It involves ever more respecting, protecting and enhancing the rights of children. And in my view, it means doing even more to involve and listen to young people whenever we make decisions about their lives or whenever collectively we're making big decisions about the future of the country that they will grow up in. And if we do all of that, if we continue to build on the wonderful legacy of Lord Cobrandon, then we will ensure the reality of the principle that I spoke about at the start, that the welfare of our children is paramount. Uh, and if we have that as our guiding principle as a society, then we will succeed in that aim of building a country that is fairer, happier and more prosperous. And we will undoubtedly live up to the inspiring and challenging legacy of Lord Cobrandon. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>